The man we already harassed earlier is Todd Gardner. He's going to give our main presentation this evening. Let's give it up. Woo! Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. I'm Todd. I'm here most months, uh, but I usually don't speak because I think all of you should speak. I'm sure that drum has been banged enough today. Today I'm going to not talk about JavaScript because Randall came to me in a panic two days ago saying, I don't have anybody to talk. I'm like, I got a new talk I want to try. Uh, and so he was desperate and I took advantage. Uh, so this is a new talk I've been putting together called the Developer's Guide to Promoting Themselves. And it's, I think, really great advice that I wish I had when I was first starting. And it's generic things about you're going to build something for somebody. And you're going to want to promote it. You're going to want to tell people about it. And so here's a bunch of tips that I've learned along the way about how to promote the things that you're working on. Whether it's just you as a developer, or your blog, or your training course, or your software project, or your open source library, or whatever it is you're building. Because all of you have a vision of something, something that you're like really excited about, something that you think should exist in the world. And it's probably one of these things, just because I talk to a lot of developers, and these are what developers tend to want to build. Um, it might be one of the other things, and that's fine too, but you probably are, are going to be building one of these. And so as engineers, we have a plan. We have a plan to get there. And the plan probably looks like a nice straight line. And so if I was to build a training course, like I recently did, I would put together a plan like, all right, I want to outline the topics I want to cover. And then I'm going to put together a draft of my training. And then I got to code up a bunch of exercises for my, for my students, for my course to go through. And then I better rehearse it once or twice or three times. And then I'll have to pull out all of the stuff that I got terribly, terribly wrong. And it seems like a pretty legit plan. But as experienced engineers, you know that it will actually look more like this. We're going to put together a big list of topics, and 90% of them are going to be garbage that are not workable and not really relevant. And then we're eventually going to get to a first draft. But most of our demos that we think about are not going to work out. They're going to be broken. Uh, they're not, the students aren't going to be able to follow them. And then you just get really afraid that this was a bad idea to begin with and you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it. If you can push back, push through that, you might rehearse it. And then like, like how I typically fall into the pit of procrastination and don't develop anything until literally hours before it is actually due. Uh, hence this presentation being constructed most of today. <laughs> but you, if you get all the way through it to an edited fully pre, full, you know, full training course, the big problem is that still no one cares. Even if you finish your product, your open source tool, your training, your blog, and release it, nobody cares. You care, probably. Your mom might care. But the world doesn't care. The world doesn't care what you've released. And so my first hot take of this presentation, great products do not sell themselves. That is false, that is a myth, that is not true. The best products still have to be sold. You still have to go out and convince people that you are actually competent, that you've built something that is valuable to them. And so that's what I wanna talk about today because all of those ideas about promoting yourself tends to be really scary for developers. For developers explicitly. There's things that our community is just generally afraid of. We're afraid of complex things that we can't figure out. We're kind of afraid of talking to strangers, in general. We're scared of slow feedback loops, and we're scared of implicit things. And marketing, promoting yourself, is full of this. This is all marketing is, is these things. All of the time that we spend building our product, our blog, our training, our product, our open source library, or whatever, all of that time and energy we put into that, you need to spend at least as much time promoting it, and probably more. 
because our natural tendency as engineers will be to gravitate towards building the next feature or building the next thing or working on the next part of it and not on talking and sharing all of the great stuff that we've already brought to the world. And so this is what I want to talk about today. Three kinds of questions that we need to answer in order to effectively promote the things that we're building. First, defining who you are. Tell who you are to the world so that they know, you know, to listen to you. Second, how do you build an audience for your thing, for your product? And finally, the hardest part, how to actually sell to your audience. So the first part, who are you? I want to quote probably my favorite unconventional marketer in the world, Fate Grimlock. Who's heard of Fate Grimlock? Anybody's heard of Fate Grimlock? Fate Grimlock is awesome. Only a handful of things ever came out of Fate Grimlock. Random blog posts and tweets. He's on Twitter still at at Fate Grimlock. He defined this term called minimum viable personality. You've probably heard minimum viable products of fairly common buzzword in startup communities. But I think minimum viable personality is more important. What do you need to define about yourself in order to actually talk intelligently about something that you want to see in the world? And so I'm going to read the fake Grimlock quote in what I can attempt to do the fake Grimlock voice. <clears throat> Most important step for build product is build product. Second most important step is build personality for product. No have personality, boring product. No one wants. <laughs> if you have a product, you have to choose be bacon, not bread. Be something that is interesting and delicious and that people want. Don't be the boring thing. So how do you define your personality? Well, it's pretty, you just have to answer three questions about what do you want to see in the world? How, one, how do you want to change the world? What is the thing that you're doing? What is it going to do for the world? Is it going to make people better JavaScript developers? Is it going to teach people how to use React? Is it going to uh, help people solve more bugs in JavaScript? Is it going to, I don't know, help people get from point A to point B while having cats in their trunk. I don't know. Silicon Valley's weird. Number two, what do you stand for? What's important to you? Not part of your core mission, but what are the things related to you that you think are important? And three, what do you hate? What are you against? You can't really be for anything unless you're against something. Are you against boring conferences? Are you against you know, nameless brands on the internet. Are you against, um, I don't know, cats. cats? Are you against cats? There's probably a very passionate market who is against cats. If you can answer these three questions, you've defined your mission, your values, and your enemy. And that's enough to have a personality. What's important to note is that the personality you want to define for your product doesn't have to be your personality. You're creating something new to talk about your product with. And it doesn't have to have the, the same idioms and to like the same things that you like and dislike the same things that you like. To find one that you feel is important for what you're trying to do. I want to talk about a personality that I've built. I run a little event called PubConf. Did anybody go to PubConf Minneapolis? Ooh, a handful of people. PubConf is not a normal software development conference. We hold it at a bar. We have a bunch of talks that are only five minutes long, strictly five minutes long. They talk about silly things. They're not allowed to actually show code or anything like that. They talk about why technology is ridiculous and why security is pointless and what to do when you screw everything up for your consulting client and you have to ask for forgiveness. We talk about dumb things and we buy a lot of beer and it's a good time. But in building this, I had to create a, person a, a personality for PubConf. And so here's some examples of PubConf's personality. PubConf is an alcoholic. <laughs> PubConf goes to distilleries. 
and watches bourbon getting made. PubConf tweets about every drink it orders. PubConf shares with its followers its favorite dairy-free, fat-free eggnog recipe. <laughs> bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> and this resonates with PubConf's target audience. <laughs> and so PubConf grows. An important part of your personality, your first expression of your personality, is probably how you design your page for your product. And I don't mean the layouts, fonts, colors, that part of design. I mean, how do you design a page so that it actually does something that you want it to do? And so the rules that I have for pages that I build is that it has to do these four things. Target an audience, have an explicit goal, make the best possible argument for that goal, and it has to load fast. And so I'm going to talk about each. All right, so target an audience. When I build a page, I think that page should be for one person. Just one person. Who am I trying to get to go to this page? Is it a customer? Is it somebody who I want to show up at my event? Is it for somebody I'm trying to partner with? Is it for an existing customer who's trying to answer a question? A page should be for one person. And once I know who that one person is, what do I want them to do? What's that one thing I want them to do that they landed on that page? Do I want them to sign up for a trial? Do I want them to buy a ticket to PubConf? Do I want them to find an answer to that question that they were trying to answer? Or do I want them to find my email address so that they can ask me whatever else they were looking for? And that that page, once I know who it's for and what I want them to do, should have everything I want on it to make the best possible argument for them to achieve that goal. I need to tell them everything that they might be asking themselves in their inner monologue. What kind of problem are they having? Like make an emotional connection to them if I can have social proof about that they're not the only one having this particular question or this particular pain? How am I going to make them a better person for doing the thing that I want them to do? Think about all of those things and that's what should be on that page. Those first three things kind of sound like a development concept called the single responsibility principle. Is that page should have one responsibility. It should say, this is for one person, one class of persons, to do one kind of thing and have everything encapsulated inside of it for them to do that one thing. The fourth thing that I try and have on pages, and is more of a tip to the development, is that it should go fast. We build fast web pages, right? When possible. Now this is a cautionary tale. Because everybody will tell you that web performance is super important and you should have your pages load as fast as possible. And oh my god, Amazon will tell you that 80% of your clicks will drop off for every second your page takes to load. But don't be too clever. This is a red herring, especially if you're building something on your own. For you to spend 80 hours shaving 10 milliseconds off of your load time by implementing some crazy new tech. Fast as possible is not the point. Get your pages loading snappy. It should feel fast. If it feels fast, it's good enough. Move on. Here's an example. One of the other things I work on that we've probably talked about a fair bit tonight is TrackJS. TrackJS is a JavaScript error monitoring service that I've been working on promoting for a number of years now. And so I've taken to heart a lot of these ideas in putting together our pages, which I want to show you. Here's the TrackJS homepage. The audience of the TrackJS homepage is a potential user. A potential user for me is a JavaScript developer. It's a JavaScript developer probably that has a bug in their web page that they're trying to fix. So that's who I want to hit this page. Based on what's above the fold visible here, what do I want them to do? I want them to start my free trial. It's the big red button right there at the top. And if they're not ready to do it, I'm telling them about like, oh, you're probably like freaked out about some bug that's hitting production right now, but I'm going to help you fix your JavaScript. And here's a bunch of things that you're going to be able to do 
after you've used Track.js. You're going to know when errors happen, and you're going to understand the impact on users. You're going to be able to get all of this great information. Oh, and here's some social proof of a bunch of other people who are already doing it. And here's some people who talked about us. Oh, and there's my call to action again. Because if you weren't convinced before, hopefully now you're convinced now to start your free trial. And if that's not enough, now I tell you how many errors I've already tracked. So here I'm making my best possible case for why my target customer should do the goal that I have of starting the free trial. And I'm even asking them to make a choice. If they want to continue on, they have, to, they have to intentionally say no. No, I'm not yet. Tell me more information. And I'm going to try and get them to get, I'm going to have a second chance to convince them. That's a great question because I was going to cover that. One of my points is that your pages should be fast. But part of making my case is I wanted to tell them how many, how many, how many errors had been tracked as a, as, a, as a piece of social proof that like I'm not just some fly-by-night operation. But I probably couldn't query my systems you know, three times a second to get that information and still be performant of any random user who hits my web page. So I don't. If you look here, this is a counter. It is a JavaScript that's increasing. But I know my audience. My audience are JavaScript developers. And my audience is going to click on that thing and figure out, how are you doing that? So I've left a note for that developer. The markup <laughs> of trackjs.com is part of the selling points of trackjs.com. Hey there, developer. As I'm sure you understand, it wouldn't be performant for me to do this. So I've set up an algorithm on how to count based on, I know I had precisely this amount at precisely this time, and here's how fast we were growing. And from there, it's just a counter. And that's an acceptable, as far as I'm concerned, that's an acceptable proxy for what the actual number is. And it lets the page still go really, really fast, because it didn't have to do anything. It's a huge reward for the developer. Yeah. And plus, yeah, the developer looks at this, and they're like, oh, yeah. That's awesome. Sweet. Sweet, dude. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> All right. Moving back to this. So that is trackjs.com and how we put together that home page that tries to do those things. All right. Let's move on to the next topic. How to build an audience. So you have the thing. You need to, like, Share it with some people. You've told your story, you figured out what you want to say. But before we spend time talking about how to build it, why do you need an audience? Why don't you just like smear some ads on Google and call it a day? Why do you need a, a separate audience from that? Because selling to friends is easier. You're all my friends now. Right? <laughs> I don't mean that literally like we're going to invite each other out to like barbecues and stuff. But, but like we've seen each other, right? We're going we're gonna to sit down at the bar together and we'll be like, oh, hey, how's it going? Come, come join our table. Like what happened earlier today with Dan. When you run across something I build three years from now, five years from now, and you say, oh, Todd built this. I know Todd. I saw him at JavaScript MN. He did that thing where he taught me how to promote stuff. Selling to people who know you is easier. They forgive the things that you did wrong, and they want you to succeed. We all want people from our communities to succeed. And so building a community just makes everything else easier. When we're building a community, we have to, to drop some assumptions about human nature and understand that everybody cares about themselves first. Everybody's trying to feed their ego, to be a bigger deal to themselves or their peers. Everybody's trying to make more money. Everybody's trying to grow themselves. And through that, we can do other things. And so we have to take a hint. My audience thinks about themselves first just as much as I think about myself first. So when I want to talk to people. Don't talk about me. Nobody cares about me. Talk about them. You're building an audience for them. Build an audience for what they want, what they care about. 
because you will succeed when your audience succeeds. So the thing you need to talk about to build an audience is you need to create stuff for them, not for you, not the things that you think are important. Create the things that the, your audience that you want wants to be, or thinks is important. Create things that are useful for them, or that are true for them, things that they need to understand. This is write. Write a blog. Write articles that you know, make a case for something you think is important. Or write a three-line snippet of some cool tech that you figured out how to get to work today. Like, create example bits of code and template projects and throw it out on, on GitHub and share it with people. Create, I put copied and pasted that twice. <coughs> Last minute. Uh, <laughs> create videos, create, create anything that your audience wants to consume and create the things that they want. And more than just creating that stuff and putting it on your site, engage them where they are. The audience that you want already exists. They're on Stack Overflow. They're on GitHub. They're on other people's blogs. They're on competitors' blogs. They're on all kinds of places. Go and engage there. Don't be spammy about it. Engage, like Ask questions. Respond to questions, talk about things, and then when, when appropriate, bring them back to your home. Bring them back to your home pages. Leave a trail of good intentions and good ideas back to wherever your, your product, your personality lives. Meet spaces, like this right now. Having face-to-face -face conversations is powerful. You can't just live on Twitter, and you can't just live on YouTube. Having a face-to-face -face conversation lets you communicate so much more about your intentions and what you know than, than any amount of text or video can. And so as a great example is me literally right now, <laughs> and all of us right now. We're having a conversation in Meet Spaces about things, and we've been having them all night. And so when you do that, Make sure people know who you are. Have a way to bring them back, like this. Here's my contact information. If you're not presenting, but you could be presenting, but if you're not presenting, have a business card. Or be like, hey, what are you on Twitter? Let's follow each other. Connect with the people that you have interesting conversations with in real life and bring them back so they become part of your audience going forward. And this is slow. This isn't the kind of thing that you can say, hey, I want to build an audience, and then you have one three months later. This is going to take years. So start now. You don't even have a, an idea for what your product's going to be. We're all good, moving on. Um, so this is going to take a while. This is going to take years for you to develop your audience. But this is a very important asset and it's going to help you no matter what you want to do in the future. So just keep doing it. Find your peers and create things, create things for them so that you all become friends. It becomes easier to sell stuff to them later. I don't mean that cynically. They're going to sell stuff to you too, and that's fine, because we all want to succeed together in whatever we're doing. All right. I'm going to move on to the third part, which is the most detailed, nitty-gritty part, how to actually sell. Warning. We're actually going to talk about marketing, which can be scary. <gasps> the funnel. How many people have heard this term? How many people have heard this term and have no idea what it means? I still don't quite know what it means. The funnel you can think of as your architecture for promotions. This is where you're going to pull people in who might be interested in your thing 
And when they fall out the bottom, they are interested in your thing and you've converted them into a customer. And so we can do all kinds of things inside of that funnel to help turn our, our friends and our leads into customers. So this is our architecture that we're going to build on. At the top of our funnel, we need to talk about how do we get different kinds of leads? Where do they come from? Because we're building an online product, probably, the channels that we're going to get stuff are going to be easily described as an internet channel. So these could be direct, like they literally typed in your web page and landed on your page. They went to their browser and they typed in trackjs.com or pubconf.io or whatever your page is. They could be organic. They searched for something on probably Google, not very likely Bing, probably Google. They searched for something and, they let, and your page came up as a result and they landed on it. And what's important to know is, well, what did they search for? They could be coming in through a social channel, so Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, any of the 10,000 other social networks that exist in the world today. Maybe you sent them an email and they came in through that. Maybe there was a link on some other page that wasn't a social network and they bounced in from that. Like maybe they clicked on a link in Stack Overflow. Or maybe you paid for that link. Maybe you bought an ad from somebody and they came in. And so these collectively are your channels. And knowing where the traffic is coming from, where your leads are coming from, lets you know which kind of communication is working for you. So this is collectively known as the top of your funnel. Once things are in your funnel, you get to talk about what do you want to do to convert them from just traffic that came in from a channel into a customer. And where they typically land, or where they always land, is a landing page. What page in your site did they hit? And remember the three points that I made about when you build a page. The page should be for a target audience, have an explicit goal, and make that best possible argument. So the first thing you can check here is, is that traffic coming in through that channel landing on the right landing page for who you want? And if not, maybe you need to change the landing page. On that page, you might have several different goals, several different steps that you want them to do in order to convert them to a customer. Now that first page should have one goal. That goal might be just an end run. You're going straight for the finish line. You want them to become a customer or whatever. Or your goal might be a smaller step. It might be to join my newsletter. It might be to sign up for a trial. It might be to um, add me on Twitter. It might be any, any number of intermediary steps before they end in, end in a customer. Now these goals depend on you and what your product is and how you think you can sell to them. But we're developers, and so this is all kind of fuzzy and hand wavy. And so we need ways to test this and understand whether or not this is working. And so this is where analytics comes in. There's lots of different analytics tools. Analytics tools aren't just something you should do generically. Analytics tools help you answer a question. And the questions that they answer are defined when you put together your funnel. Your funnel is a series of questions. Where is my traffic coming from? What pages are they landing on? Do those pages achieve their goals? Do those goals lead on to the next thing I want them to do? You've at, those are your questions. Add analytics to your site to answer those questions. Don't just add it for everything. Answer the questions that you need to for your funnel to, to perform well. The analytics is your architecture testing harness. Now this is slow. This isn't like running your unit tests, you make a code change and you have feedback a fraction of a second later. The feedback you're going to get from analytics is going to take days or weeks or depending on all of the steps in your funnel, months. When you make a change to how your page looks, you need to wait a while to get a good amount of traffic back through to make decisions about whether or not that change was good or not. But without that feedback loop, you're just guessing in the dark. There's lots of great analytics tools. Many of them are free. 
Some of them aren't. Google Analytics is probably where everyone starts, and it's free. Mixpanel is also good, has a free option. Google Analytics is great for generic web traffic. Like you have a web page that is open to the public and you want to do stuff with it. Google Analytics is great for that. If you have a product and you want to identify individual users and how they interact, Mixpanel and Intercom and KISS metrics are all great for that. That's where those, those things target. But even if you have those things, there's probably things custom about what you are doing that you'll probably need to augment this. I haven't talked to anybody who's really successful at building analytics that only uses one thing. Most people use several things and bring them together in some sort of custom spreadsheet or something somewhere. So when you're bringing in your analytics, you use the analytics to add a specific test for your funnel. But don't overdo it. Don't test everything for, or don't, don't just add metrics for everything because you're going to slow everything down. Analytics are often some of the slowest parts of web applications. How many times have you been on a web page and it's loading like 16 different analytics pixels as you're trying to like navigate through it? You're destroying the performance of your page and you're actually impacting your funnel by trying to measure it, like quantum mechanics. You change the results by measuring it. Only ask the questions, only instrument the questions that you need to answer. And for everything else, stay out of the way. Don't slow it down. Here's an example of a funnel. This is, this is TrackJS's funnel. Now, I'm not going to show you conversion rates at any individual step because that's proprietary and secret. I'm not going to tell you. Um, but here's how we think of it. So our leads come in through a number of channels, and we hit one of six different landing pages. The landing pages are targeted based on um, where did they come in from, what languages they were searching for, sometimes what frameworks they were using. Um, like there's a different landing page for React users than Angular users, um, because we're trying to make a different case to each of them. And the first thing that I actually want them to do is I don't always necessarily want them to sign up for a trial, although I'd love that. Sometimes I just want them to sign up for my email list. I prompt users to sign up for an email course on how to debug JavaScript applications. I'll send them a handful of emails about it and then drop them into my newsletter. And I'm trying to give them something valuable right away. Here's a bunch of tips on how to debug JavaScript. I'm trying to make them my friend. I'm trying to, to engage with people and help them with a problem that they're having for free so that we like each other. And maybe they'll respond to me and we'll email back and forth a few times. So that at the end, they'll come back and they'll sign up for a trial. Now, Trek.js, signing up for a trial isn't, isn't the end all be all. You haven't paid me anything yet. I haven't actually, I haven't won anything. So after a user signs up for a trial, I actually need them to install it. Like, being I'm a developer tool, I actually need somebody to do something. They have to copy and paste some code or put a library on a page or do something. And so that's actually a really important metric for me. It's like, how often has somebody you moved from they gave me their email address to they took an action on their code base? That's like an important activation metric for me. Think about in the thing that you're building, what are the likely signs that somebody's going to pay you? Like what, what are those, thing, those steps that they'll take that you can track so that you can push people, not necessarily to get all the way to the finish line, but just to take that next important step. And finally, for me, to subscribe, to give me a credit card number, to pay me, we win, we have a customer. So what does it mean to be a customer? Well, out the bottom of the funnel will come your customers. Now, for revenue-based products, for things that you're doing that actually generate money, we can put all kinds of other like additional math behind this to understand what that's worth. If you're not doing a revenue-based thing, like you're just doing something out of the good of your heart, you're building an open source project, then thank you, but I don't know how to measure the value of a one customer. For a revenue-based product, we can think of it in terms of the lifetime value of a customer. When somebody buys something from us, when they give us some money, what is the lifetime value of, of winning that customer? If you are like a boutique shop, if you sell t-shirts, 
maybe your lifetime value is the cost of one t-shirt because who buys more than one t-shirt from any one shop, right? They probably aren't gonna go back and buy more. If your value, or if you're some blog, you have a different lifetime value. Here's an example. Let's say you have a fairly popular blog and you get to sell ads on your blog. Let's say you're David Walsh. I imagine a lot of us, if you're searching for JavaScript things, you felt, found, uh, fell your way onto davidwalsh.name. He's a Mozilla guy. He runs a really popular blog. This is in his numbers. I just made these numbers up. I don't know how much money he makes. But so here's a blog. Let's say that he make $2,000 a month in advertising revenue. And then let's say that they get about 1.5 million hits a month in traffic. So this is a pretty, they're doing pretty well as far as the blog goes. And then on any individual user that hits their blog, the average is they look at 2.1 pages. So they'll stick around, they'll read the first article, they'll read a second article, but then they'll probably bounce out. So we can think of what is the lifetime value of a customer as you have $2,000 divided across 1.5 million hits times 2.1 hits per session, or about 0.28 cents is what one customer is worth to you. For something like PubConf, which is an event, we have a higher lifetime value of a customer. So here's some real numbers for an upcoming PubConf event in Norway. These are all, like the numbers were originally in Norwegian Kroner, so I've had to like round some things here because I got nasty like decimal points converting Kroner to dollars. But so it's about a $30 ticket to buy a ticket to PubConf Oslo. And we have about a 25% return rate, which means a quarter of the people who attend a PubConf event go on to attend the subsequent one. So I can think of my lifetime value as $30, the cost of, that they paid for one ticket, plus a quarter of the cost for the next ticket. Now I could probably like go on and on and on and be more specific about that, but you know, law of diminishing returns, I'm just gonna call it for two events. So it's about $37 is what I think the value is of one person converting for PubConf. Now, once I know what a customer is worth to me, I can start like running all kinds of like fancy calculations to get more customers. Because if I put a dollar in the top of my funnel to get more leads, and I know how well my funnel performs, and I know what something falling out the bottom of my funnel is worth, I can figure out if it's worth putting more money into the top. So for example, there's actually like boring marketing words for all of these things. Like paying to put more things into the top of your funnel is called cost per click. You're gonna buy an ad on Twitter or Google or Facebook or on some guy's blog or whatever, and you're gonna pay every time a user clicks on that ad. Now the funnel itself has a conversion rate of like for every user that hits the top of the funnel, what percentage of them fall out the bottom? You can figure that out if you've actually defined your goals in there. You can figure out I had, you know, 100 people come into the top, I had four come out the bottom, 4% conversion rate. And then if you know those things, you can figure out what does it cost you to acquire a user? So the cost I pay to get a user to click times how likely they are to become a customer is the cost to acquire one user. Nope, because CVR is a percentage, so it'd be like 0 0.08. So it'll get smaller. Wait. Yeah, maybe you're right. The cost per click will be low, the cost to acquire will be high. No, you're, no, you're right, you're right. So if I pay a dollar for, for a click and I have... Yeah, you're, you're right. Hold on, we're gonna fix this live. We'll do it live! We'll do it live!
No, thank, thank you. you, sir. <laughs> All right. So we'll divide those through, and we can actually figure out what does it cost us to acquire a customer. So as a rule of thumb, this isn't this, you need to like evaluate this for whatever you're doing, but the cost to acquire a customer probably should be a third of the lifetime value or less. As in, if you spend more to acquire a customer than they're worth to you, you're losing money fast. If you're even spending the same, you're losing money fast because you have no money to actually like provide services to that customer and you're not making any money off of it. You need to have some headroom on how you're going to make money, you're going to pay for their services, you're going to do stuff. And so rule of thumb, you need to spend a third or less to acquire a customer. So here's some data for PubConf. So this is preliminary data for PubConf Oslo. So the PubConf funnel is performing at 11.81%. So for every person who lands on, a PubConf, on the PubConf Oslo website, 11% buy a ticket. Pretty happy with that right now. That's pretty high. That's awesome. Yeah, things are going really well. We got, this is our second event in Oslo this year. People know what it is. They're, they're happy about it. They, they, they like it. And my lifetime value of a PubConf Oslo customer is $37.50. So kind of going backwards, a third of $37.50 is about $12.50. So I need to spend less than $12.50 to acquire a customer, and I feel like I'm doing okay. So if I bring that back, that means I need to spend less than $1.47 per click. Cost per click, not cost per lead. If I can spend less than that, I'm doing okay. So PubConf, I primarily advertise on, on Twitter because that's where the audience is. That's where the people who want to go out drinking with other developers tend to be. That's hard one research right there. So let's take a look at the PubConf Twitter uh, advertisements and see how that goes. So we're going to actually look at some real ads. So this is the PubConf Twitter advertising account. And so I have an ad right now running for PubConf Oslo. So we're going to edit it. I'm going to show you what my ads look like on how I target them. So I'm, need, I'm shooting for $1.47 or less in my cost. So here is what my, my campaign looks like. So I'm running a campaign for PubConf Oslo. Now, what I want to track in that is I want to track that they have um, gone to my website. That, that's the success condition for me. Now, social networks tend to be really flaky with what they consider conversions. Sometimes they're like, oh, somebody saw your tweet, that's a conversion. Or somebody liked your tweet, that's a conversion. And I think that's bullshit. I want them to go to my website where I can actually do something with them. And in order to do that, you have to install a little bit of their tracking code on your website which we're not going to go into, but there's some documentation on how to do it for both Twitter and Facebook and anything else you might use. So I've installed that on PubConf so that I know when a Twitter user is actually coming through. And so then I get to choose who do I want to target. Now, Twitter has some pretty good targeting, frankly. And so based on who I know comes in for the main conference that I piggyback onto called NDC, uh, there's a lot of people from Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and the United Kingdom who come in for that conference. So that's who I'm advertising to. That's where I target my ads. And even more than that, I want to target some specific topics, people who are interested in software or developers or programming, trying to narrow it down and get only the people who I think might be relevant. Uh, targeting boozy keywords, not so relevant. That's come out in prior tests. Then I take all the people who are speaking at PubConf and I add them in as I want to target all of their followers and anybody who's like their followers. Because the people who are likely to come to PubConf are people who already know who are the people who are going to be making jokes. So it's really easy to just add all of their, their names in. People who are like, like, you probably know people who are your target customer. When you target ads, when you have the capability of targeting, just put the people who you want as your customers. Just even if they're like, oh, I'm building a JavaScript thing. Maybe I want to target uh, Paul Irish. 
sure, target Paul Irish's followers and, and bring them all in. So here I'm targeting the followers of all of our speakers. I bring them in on how much I want to spend and how I want to optimize for. So PubConf Oslo, I'm spending $20 a day. And what I want to optimize for, which is um, important on how it's going to actually bid out, is what you're bidding on. Do you want to optimize to get the most clicks, which is my near-term goal, but not my end goal? My end goal is to actually convert on my website, which is some data you have to send them. So I built some ads. All of my ads feature this people involved in PubConf. So I create a little backdrop with the PubConf logo, and I stick a headshot of all the different people involved, like me and Troy Hunt and Kylie Hunt and Jessica Kerr and all of these other people. That was a fun night of drinking and Photoshop cropping all these heads out. And we made ads for all of them. And we're going to leave. We're not going to make any modifications to that. And then once that's been running, we can actually take a look at our ads and see how they are responding. So here are every one of my ads that I um, have a headshot of the speaker and some stuff. I can see how many times they've been shown and how many times they've been clicked. I'm actually going to show all this data. So I'm going to sort this by results. And I can see who are the ads that people are clicking on the most. So I could use this for evil to like put one speaker against each other of saying who is more popular on the internet. Because clearly Mark Rendell is the most popular one on the internet, like by far, 156 clicks versus 30. And it rounds it all up for me that my cost per click is $1.10, which is pretty good. I can look at, at these, and some of them are, are better and some of them are worse. Like Mark Rendell has a lot, but it's $1.11. Lars Clint is, is not as good, but he's only 99 cents. So he, I, there's a lot. Oh, Troy Hunt only has four, but it's only 50 cents a click. So that's pretty good for how many times his ad's been shown. So boiling all the numbers together and multiplying out the dollar 10 that it's actually costing me per click times the ratio or times my funnel performance it's costing me my cost to acquire is about eight dollars and 55 cents and that spits out 37.50 worth of customer lifetime value that i use to buy beer <laughs> pubconf has turned into an internet powered beer fueling machine that just, I pump in a dollar and thir three spit back out the other side. And I can just buy more beer for everybody involved. And so I think that's been pretty great. So these are the three parts that we talked about a little bit today. Who are you, how to build an audience, and how to sell. Defining who you are, the minimum viable personality. I highly encourage anybody interested to go and read some more stuff by Fate Grimlock. He's a wizard on the subject. Define who you want to, what you're trying to change in the world, what do you stand for, and who are you against? And that's, that, that's the start of your personality online. When you're building an audience, make sure you're creating stuff for them, for your audience. Don't just say what you want to say over and over again. Don't jump right into selling your training or selling your blog or selling your software. Talk about stuff that's relevant for your audience because they want to read stuff that's relevant for them before they read about what's for you. And then we talked about the funnel. The funnel is this architecture foundation that you need to think about for your product. Put stuff in there on what's important to you and test it. So that's it. That was the developer's guide to promoting themselves. Thanks a lot. I hope you got some fun.